Hello and welcome to Downstream, the Navara media interview series that cracks open big ideas like it's a lovely tropical coconut, fills it with lime, a dash of rum and serves it up with a cocktail umbrella and a straw. And I am delighted to be talking to Professor David Nutt, Professor of Neuropsychopharmacology. Can you tell I've been practicing saying that all morning? <laughs> uh, at Imperial. Thank you so much for joining us, David. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Are you for a David asking. or a Dave? Just you can call me. Well, me. it depends. If there's other Davids in the room, I call myself Dave, but uh, you can call me whatever. Dave just or David. Call me. I don't mind. <laughs> Um, so not to, not to cast aspersions on the celebrity status of neuropsychopharmacologists, but a lot of our viewers might be familiar with you because of your work on drugs in particular. So for those who are unfamiliar, David is the author of Drugs Without the Hot Air, Minimizing the Harms of Legal and Illegal Drugs. And you sat on the government's advisory council on the misuse of drugs until you were dismissed by the then Home Secretary, Alan Johnson, after arguing in a paper that alcohol, tobacco, and horse riding are more dangerous than some illegal drugs like mm. LSD and ecstasy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what you've got to say about horse riding while on LSD, but maybe we could save that question <laughs> for the end. <laughs> I never recommend anyone riding a horse. It's far too dangerous for the rider and for the horse. Yeah, I don't. I, I, I don't stick with LSD myself. Um so for those who, who might not know your work, what is your position on illegal drugs and how does it differ from the government's? Uh, well, my position is that the concept of illegality is a very charged one. Uh, at a very simple level, my research and that of hundreds of other people who've been in this field for longer than me, it's clearly shown that the, the, the legal illegal status of a drug has got nothing to do with it, whether it's harmful or not but it's largely driven by political expediency at the time it gets discovered. So what does a harm reduction approach to drugs even mean? How do you quantify harm across different substances? Well, that's where we have made a significant uh, advance. Uh, we, about 10 years ago, we decided to uh, develop what you might call a transparent, systematic way of assessing drug harms. And we did it through a group of experts. And we, we use a technique called multi-criteria decision analysis, and that is an extremely powerful way of comparing anything you like, but certainly in the case of comparing drug harms, where it allows us to compare harms from the drug, like are you going to die if you take fentanyl, with the harms f uh, that come from, say, producing the drug, like you know the, the war in Afghanistan or the deforestation in Peru relating to coca production. Uh, it turns out that there are 16 harms of drugs. There are nine harms to the user. And there are seven harms to society. And this MCDA approach allows us to collate all of them and come up with a single figure of harm. And we did that. We published it in The Lancet in 2010. And uh, it turns out that alcohol is the most harmful drug in the UK, which is why I was sacked, because I was saying that drugs like LSD and MDMA are way less harmful than alcohol. And the government didn't want to know that because uh, the drinks industry didn't want them to know that. And the... Um, Many newspapers didn't want them to know that. In fact, most people don't want to know that because most people drink. <laughs> I mean, when I was growing up, it was the Leah Betts era. So there was yes. a VHS and a teacher would pop it on. Yes. And what I learned about ecstasy was from the case of Leah Betts, yes. who took ecstasy at a party. And I think a friend of hers was convicted of drug dealing, who was a teenager as well. Mm -hmm. So I grew up thinking that all drugs are equally dangerous to the user. Mm -hmm. So you've said that alcohol, you know, according to this, you know, matrix of criteria that you guys have put together is, is the most dangerous in the UK. The most but harmful, does that mean that sorry, all others the most harmful to the UK, harmful. but not the most harmful to the user. The most harmful to the user uh, is crack, crack cocaine, crystal meth, heroin. Um, the reason alcohol is the most harmful in the UK is because so many people use it. I would estimate probably every family in Britain has been damaged uh, uh, from alcohol, either because someone's become dependent or harmed by it, or because someone who's been drinking has damaged them. So thinking about, about the difference between harm and danger, I think, is mm. the really important point yes. here. Yes. And so... You've made the point about the drinks industry, but how is it that relatively new drugs like ecstasy or mm. synthetic drugs mm. accrue this sense of, of danger? They very quickly get placed mm. in that category of this is dangerous and no mm. one should use them. How does that happen? 
Well, the newspapers lie about them, and politicians lie about them, and there are, there are, there are organisations, Puritan, Puritan-based organisations that want to eliminate all drug use. Actually, they quite like to eliminate alcohol use too. If you once you scrape the surface, you realise they're actually they're prohibitionists through and through, and they'd like to get rid of all drug use. But they know they can't do alcohol. It was tried and it failed in America and Sweden and Norway in the 1920s. So they're basically they attack new drugs because there's not such a vested interest in maintaining their availability. So when you're when you're putting together a model for assessing the harm of drugs, how do you separate the harm of the substance from the harm of criminalization? Yeah, excellent question. And the answer is we, with difficulty is the answer, but we have tried to subsequently to look into that. We've done that in two ways. So after our this is the landmark Lancet paper, we then went and looked at uh, different classes of drug and, and did some analyses on those. So for instance, we took opiates and we looked at opiates, uh, whether they're used legally or illegally. And it is clear that illegal use of opiates contributes a greater, they're more harmful when you use them illegally than when you use them legally, which makes sense for two reasons. One is, of course, if you're injecting in a, you know, in a gutter or the back, you know, door of a, a shop somewhere, you know, you, you're not going to get sterile sterility of needles, etc. And also, you don't know the source. The illegal source can produce contaminated drugs. Or, and now, a particular problem with opiates is that you might be buying, thinking you're buying heroin, but you're getting fentanyl and it can kill you. So, yeah, so we've done that. We've done also done that with, um, to some extent, with, with tobacco products, showing that uh, Vaping is um, way, way less harmful than um, tobacco smoking. So, so we can dissect apart the the, the harms of drugs from, in terms of how they're used and how they're ex- assessed. But the other thing we've done more recently, which people don't know so much about, is we've looked at um, modelling different regulatory systems. That's even more complicated than regu- looking at the harms of drugs. As I said, there were 16 harms of drugs, but if you look at the... Uh, the number of variables you have to consider when you're looking at different regulatory systems, it turns out there are 27. So there's issues around crime, there's issues around policing, there's issues around, well, the most interesting one of all, to some extent, is the issue around to what extent does a policy corrupt politicians? Uh, and then there's also the health costs and the education costs, and etc. So there are 27 separate kind of costs you have to look at in order to work out which policy might give the best overall uh, outcome in terms of uh, minimizing damage and maximizing benefit. Uh, and we were able to do that for uh, three drugs. We did it for alcohol as a sort of prototypical kind of, you know, that's our control, and cannabis. Uh, and, and interestingly, for both of those drugs, so state control um, came out on top. So state control is better for alcohol and better for cannabis. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because state control of alcohol is what they do in Sweden. And state control of cannabis is what they do in Uruguay. Uh, so those two countries have got it right, according to this very detailed analysis we've done. I mean, so one of the things that you've written about is the way in which currently the system we have pulls problematic users, people who suffer from problems with addiction, into that you phrased it as they get pulled into the dragnet mm. of the criminal justice system. And I thought that was really wonderful, evocative mm. phrasing. Mm. Could you expand on that a little bit and perhaps tell us what your views are on the decriminalization of all psychoactive substances well personal use personal possession of all drugs should be decriminalized absolutely you know, that's that's hardly you know hardly anyone's going to argue against that because because criminalization just makes things worse as you you pointed out once people get a criminal record they get sucked into an underclass uh, where uh, they find it very difficult. Even if you've got a, rec- a criminal record of cannabis possession, you, it, you can be denied access to teaching, to becoming a teacher, to becoming a policeman. If you want to join the army, you can only join at the level of a private. You can't join at the level of an officer. So there's enormous deleterious effects on people's career from these criminalizations. And of course, it's an extraordinary racist policy because we know that four to five times greater likelihood of having a criminal record if you're if you're a black or a minority than if you're white and we know that you've got very little chance of being convicted if you're um, a conservative minister and uh, like michael gove you know even if you admit to cocaine you still become 
the most, second most powerful man in the British government. Or Boris so, Johnson, who went yeah. on Have I Got News to For You and boasted of, of doing cocaine. Well, as a young man. yes, he's now denied it. He said it was probably caster sugar, but uh, you know, anyway. Well, well, he paid probably, £100 a gram for caster sugar. My God. Well, he's very rich. <laughs> And anyway, but let's, let's put the policies. The, the reality is, it's a racist policy. It's a it's a, a policy designed basically to disadvantage people who don't vote, to, to uh, give you know to encourage uh, or to to appease the bloodlust of right wing newspapers who like to see people punished for doing things that that their readers would like to do but haven't got the courage to do, and uh, and it creates an underclass. And, in, and when you're in an underclass, what do you do? Well, about the only thing you can do uh, and this is really really absolutely the case in the states is deal drugs because that's mm. the, only, the only job you've got so you end up so you create you know the drug markets are created by people who've been punished for using drugs and it's become self-fulfilling i mean one of the things that i'm interested in is the way in which proponents of decriminalization there's a consensus around decriminalizing possession for personal use and then it starts to fall apart when you start talking about possession with intent to supply and when you look at convictions for dealing, black people are 1.4 times more likely to receive an immediate custodial sentence for the same crimes as a, as a white person. So that itself is racialized. So how do you deal with the inequalities you see in convictions for dealing without saying, well, we'd have to decriminalize or indeed legalize and regulate that too? We just give better guidance to judges. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Yeah, I mean, you know, because the judges make... the Convictions are done by juries, but the judge decides on the penalties. And, and if there are inequalities, which, as you pointed out, there are, there are worse inequalities, by the way. The inequalities relate to the type of drug. They're even worse than relating mm. to, to your ethnicity or your colour. The long, Do you know which drug gives you the longest prison sentence for dealing? Mm, I would guess crack, but maybe yeah, would, Everyone would, but it's MDMA. Mm. Why is it MDMA? Because judges hate young people having fun. They can accept that a crack dealer might be doing a purpose because he might be helping people who are addicted to crack. But if you're selling MDMA, all you're doing is giving young people a chance to have fun. And that's a really bad thing. You mustn't let young people have fun because they might enjoy it. I mean, one of the things I'm really interested in is how different drugs accrue different narratives mm -hmm. around them. Mm -hmm. This is something which... Um, Dr. Carl Hart, who's very open about his own mm -hmm. uh, psychoactive substance use, he admits to taking amphetamines, cocaine, even heroin. Um, he's quite keen to bust some of these myths. But for instance, taking MDMA and the kind of social circles I move in is very, you know, is commonplace mm -hmm. and it's not stigmatized mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. But when you talk to people about other drugs, perhaps mm -hmm. cocaine or even heroin, mm -hmm. the moral tone of the conversation changes. And to what extent are people who, you know, are, are in favor of decriminalization, maintaining these quite racialized and classed distinctions about which drugs are the good ones and which ones are the evil, irredeemable ones? Yeah, it's hard for me to comment on that because um, what you're talking about is anecdote. And, mm. and, and one of the things <laughs> I've often said, if you want to change drug policy, the most powerful tool in the whole of the armory of tools to change drug policy is fashion. Mm -hmm. Fashion is infinitely more powerful than legislation or education or exhortation. Some, some drugs are fashionable in some groups and some are unfashionable. And, and, and a lot of the change in drug use that we see on a regular basis is driven by fashion. So, you know, your, I don't know if you've got brothers and sisters, but your younger brothers and sisters probably would want, not want to do what you do simply because you do it. You know, they, and they certainly don't want to do what their parents do. Because, <laughs> so fashion is really important, so that, and that's a factor. Um, but in terms of general messaging... I mean, there's only one key, key, well, there are two key rules I say about drugs. There's absolutely two ways to minimize harm. Never inject and never get caught. <laughs> but I mean, on the never get caught part, we effectively have a two-tier justice system. If you're of my social class, you are unlikely to be stopped and searched, even if you are a person of color like me. Right, I can go through Notting Hill Carnival and nobody's bothering me. Is that, Whereas well, if you're, you're a sure it's not because you're a woman? Lad, 
Well, I think that's an element of it as well. Mm. But it's also the fact that, you know, the kind of parties I go to, police aren't raiding that. No, no one gives no. a crap. No. Um, whereas you walk through Notting Hill Carnival, and, you know, you see the same group mm. of young black lads getting stops and searched again and again. You've got a two tier system. Effectively, mm. it's decriminalized for people who are well off enough mm. or insulated mm. by virtue mm. of their race or their gender. Mm -hmm. And you're policed, harassed and surveilled mm. if you're not. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, it's not to do with... We've seen in terms of the stuff in search of uh, successful black sports people. If you, even if you're rich and black, you're deemed to be a drug dealer <laughs> just because you're rich and black. I mean, it, the, the, look, the, the drug laws were conceived, they started in 19, about 1910. They were, and then the, they were, they've always been conceived to, to find the other, to identify the other, a group that you can vilify so that you can pretend that you're doing something to protect, in this country, the white middle classes from them. And you, you find a group that can't protest be, so that you can abuse them as much as you like and get away with it. So it starts off with the Chinese. So, you know, mm -hmm. we start creating hysteria about Chinese opium dens and young women and white women are going and smoking opium and having sex with Chinese men, you know, or souls, sailors and that. You know, it's, it's racist completely. What, what happens? Oh, so you ban opium and then people, oh, strangely, start injecting morphine, which is considerably worse. But but the, the policy then goes on and, and uh, America has prohibition, which um, failed. But when prohibition is uh, restored, when alcohol is restored to America, the Drug Enforcement Agency, as it's now become, under Harry Anslinger, has to have something else to keep it. You know, it's a business, so they have to have employment. So they turn against Mexicans and they start to associate Mexicans with cannabis and they start to attack them and and so it goes on and of course the ultimate sort of pinnacle of the deceit is uh, the 1968 Nixon uh, election when he's going for re-election the war on uh, the war in war in Vietnam is mm. failing he's going to lose because everyone hates the war in Vietnam so he creates an internal scare he creates scare about drugs. He creates the war on drugs so people forget the war in Vietnam. And his, um, what we would now call, you know, his minder, his um, thought agent, his Cummings says, uh, who's Ehrlich, John Ehrlichman says, okay, what we got to do? Well, we've got to scare the American people. So we, we're gonna, we've we got two opponents. We've got the anti-war left, and they're not really left, they're just sensible people. And we've got black people. So we're going to vilify them because we're going to tell the world or tell America that the anti-war left are all t t taking cannabis and black people are taking heroin. And we're going to scare Americans that these people are going to take over America. So we've got to fight the drugs and we're going to fight the people. And as he said, it's so, it's so graphic. He said, by accusing them of drug taking, illegal drug taking, we could vilify them. We could break up their meetings. We could abuse them night after night on the evening news, completely throw attention away from Vietnam onto these, these underclasses. And, uh, and then win the election. It was an br absolutely brilliant campaign. <laughs> I mean, he went from losing the election to winning every state except Maine. And as Ehrlichman said afterwards, did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Everyone knows they're lying. All politicians know they're lying about drugs, but they just choose to lie because it's an easy way of getting political victory. But a, a point that um, uh, Rick Lyons uh, makes, and I, I really like his work on drugs, one of the things that he says is that the UN 1961 Treaty on Drugs mm -hmm. is the only UN treaty to use the word evil. The word evil doesn't appear oh, in the right, treaty on exactly. apartheid, the exactly. treaty on slavery or <laughs> yeah, genocide exactly. or rape as a weapon of war. It's only mm. drugs. Mm. And so thinking about how that developed, I think, you know, as you said, out of, you know, identifying an internal mm. other mm. Chinese mm. people, mm. opium, mm. that's something which has now, you know, been entrenched in international law. So if you want to start shifting that point of view, where do you start? Do you start with saying we're going to decriminalize at a local level? Do you start by trying to build social movements, changing culture? How do you deal with the fact that we have embedded in our political imagination the idea that drugs are evil? Well, you tell the truth. You have programs like this which educate people about the history, and a lot of people don't realize. Most doctors... When I say I'm working with psilocybin for depression, they say, oh, well, that's a really dangerous drug. It's a Schedule One drug, and it must be addictive. And I say, no, it's not addictive. 
and it's not dangerous. And they say, well, it must be. It's in Schedule 1. And I say it's in Schedule 1 for political reasons, because of the Vietnam War and people protesting the Vietnam War under LSD. But the lies that have been told have been told for so long and, and uh, with such vigour that even educated people believe them. And so you're quite right. And, and the change has to come through education, but also in, in emphasising, and this is where we're currently working hard, emphasising the fact that illegality has had almost no impact on use. For some drugs like psilocybin, LSD, it has no, had no impact on harm. For some drugs like opiates, it's actually worse than the harm. Uh, but the really compelling argument to my mind is that it has denied access of proven therapies to people who need them. And, and that's the really criminal thing. And most people can eventually understand that it makes no sense to deny medical access to a drug, even if it was to reduce recreational use, which it isn't. So that is, that's so are, are the arm. cases you're talking about, you know, there's been studies done on the use of ketamine to treat mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, alcoholism, mm -hmm. psilocybin for depression, but mm -hmm. also for Crohn's disease mm -hmm. um, and issues to do with inflammation. That was one study I was reading about. Um, and obviously cannabis for, for chronic mm -hmm. pain and, well, and other issues as well. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the kind of research you do, what for you are the areas where if you go, you know what, if we decriminalise drugs use, there are these health issues which could really be dealt with. What for you are the most urgent ones? Oh, addiction. That you see? Addiction. This is the ultimate paradox. People say we cannot make these drugs legal because they're addictive. And I say they're not addictive. They've never been addictive. They're anti-addictive. And they say, no, they must be addictive because they're illegal drugs. And this, this illegality paradox actually... Oh, I don't want to talk about my history, but it does go back to a conversation I had with the Home Secretary, Jackie Smith, in 2009, when she insisted that illegality was the defining feature of a drug rather than harm. I mean, it was completely surreal. But I'll just tell you, I just actually, just as an aside, on Saturday night on the Radio 5 Live on the Steve Nolan show, I, I had the most surreal conversation with, uh, with an ex-MP, with Edwina Curry, about the whole issue about... Drug testing in prisons, a completely failed policy, a policy that's so, so failed, it's led to hundreds and hundreds of deaths in prisons because people switched from cannabis to spice. And she could not accept that it was viable or allow, allowable to actually uh, to, to evaluate the policy. Her view is, well, we've got to test prisoners to stop them taking drugs. And I said, well, but they're still taking drugs and taking worse drugs. So it hasn't your policy failed? No. And I said, what evidence, what actual evidence could ever convince you your policies failed? And she said, effectively, none, because it's a policy. So that's gone off the track a little bit, but it just emphasises that there's, there's still this enormous conflict between politicians who say policies are what matter and, and sane people who say actually outcomes are what matter. So what am I doing? Let me answer your question. What am I, what, the most important area is addiction. Well, the most important, actually, the most important study, we've got to go, let's go back to the very beginnings of the psychedelic era. Let's go back to, to a man called Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson founded Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. He cracked his alcoholism. He freed himself, as he describes it, from the chains of alcoholism, having had a psychedelic trip. And he realized it's once he took LSD subsequently, and he was a guy that actually gave LSD to Huxley, he realized that LSD could be used to break the shackles of alcoholism in many people. And he got the US government to, to conduct six trials, usually one or two doses of LSD in people with alcoholism. And the effect, the effect sizes we see, the clinical effect was twice as big as anything we have ever had to treat alcoholism since. But when LSD got banned because of the Vietnam War, so all research on um, LSD and alcoholism stopped. And there's never been a trial since. But if you look at those six trials and you look at that effect size and you think, well, what could have happened if we carried on using LSD? And I've estimated that in, those, in the 50 odd years since it was banned, probably over 100 million people worldwide have died prematurely from alcoholism. And let's say LSD saved 10% of them. It would probably do better, but let's just say it was 10%. Well, that would be 10 million lives saved. Now look at the other side of the equation. How many people's lives have been saved by the ban of LSD? Well, I mean, probably none, but let's be generous. Let's say, well, maybe, maybe if, you know, a few people have been deterred from using it. So maybe a thousand lives have been saved. So you've got a thousand lives here and you've got 10 million lives <laughs> on the other side. That equation is so imbalanced. No one in their right mind except a politician could possibly argue that it was irrational to ban LSD. 
there are people who will say, looking at Scotland, for instance, which has got the highest rate of drugs mm-hmm. deaths in, in Western Europe, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. saying, well, look, facilitating the sale of drugs in that context, obviously it's worsened by deprivation, economic inequalities, lack of opportunities, but facilitating the distribution or possession of drugs in that context would be wildly irresponsible. What would your response be to that? I don't have a clue what they're talking about. What are they talking about? You're talking about decriminalising personal possession? Well, you, that's utterly responsible. That is what you need to do. What you need to do, you, you know, we, Portugal's done it. Portugal decriminalised possession. In the 15 years of decriminalisation of heroin possession, people with heroin get treatment. They get basically free heroin or methadone or some other treatment, and they start dying. And in those 15 years, deaths from opiates in Portugal have decreased to one third of what they were before. In Scotland and in Britain, we've carried on prohibiting people, criminalising them for using heroin, and deaths from opiates have gone up by two thirds. So, so the answer is we know the answer. Everyone, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's not even just, you know, even need, you can't don't need to debate it. You just got to have s- systems in place which allow people access to treatment rather than prison. Do you think that when it comes to a drug like fentanyl, which has been partially responsible for many of the opiate deaths that we've seen in the United States, it's been making its way over here. Is there a way to safely control access to something like fentanyl? Or is the only way to shift people off of it is in some way to facilitate them accessing safer opiates and essentially closing down the market for, for, for fentanyl in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I'm sounding like a kind of, you know, I'm just a bent, broke record, aren't I? But when you look back over over 150 years of drug policy, you see the same mistakes being made over and over and over again. In the face of people like me with some knowledge and expertise pointing out that what these mistakes are being made. And fentanyl is, of course, you know, this is... In some ways, one of the worst examples of all. So maybe your, your you know, your listeners don't fully understand what's gone on in America. So in America, uh, in the, by the turn of just about the turn of the century, um, there was a big increase in the prescription of morphine derivatives for pain, uh, particularly in the public health system over there, the Medicaid system. People in pain were getting treatment, and that's kind of partly a good thing. Some, but. A lot of that treatment was being given out rather, a bit, you know, a bit excessively. And uh, people in the families of those who were getting these uh, you know, painkillers like oxycodone were taking them and using them. So there was a rise in opiate misuse uh, amongst that population, usually poor whites living outside of cities. Government said, we've got a problem. We've got an opiate crisis because some of the kids, teenagers, you know, were taking that and dying. So they then put a massive clamp down on the prescribing of these opiates like oxycodone. But they didn't put into place anything to help people stop using. So they went, if you stop prescribing an opiate, what do you get, cold turkey? People don't like cold turkey. What did they do? They went out on the streets and they bought opiates. The first drug they could get, because that was the one that was available, was heroin. Now, heroin has never been a medicine in America. Well, it was banned in 1948. So when you see 20,000 heroin deaths, you know that's black market. There's no way that's coming from the health system. So there's this surge of heroin deaths. So then they decide to clamp down on heroin to stop them dying. And unfortunately, uh, at that point, the Mexican cartels who were supplying the heroin realized, and it's quite interesting, it took them a long time, it took them 20 years to realize, that there were alternatives to heroin called fentanyls. And fentanyls are, for the black market, a fantastic drug. Because fentanyl itself, which is one of the weakest fentanyls, is is twice as is fifty times as potent as heroin and half the price. So then you can increase your profit margins by about a hundredfold. So they switched to fentanyls, and then they went on to over a hundred different fentanyls. Now are have been detected uh, on the black market as um, as opioids, and now they've got seventy thousand or a hundred thousand. I don't know. It keeps going up each year. Deaths in America from fentanyls. So we've created not only the problem of people needing the black market by stopping prescribing you know, to them, but also we've created a worse black market. And fentanyls are in Britain. We've had, I think, 70 deaths last year, and we have to do something about it. So your question really was, what can we do about it? And um, the answer is, well, let's not make it worse. So the first thing is anyone wants treatment, anyone's using an opiate, 
should be allowed to walk into a clinic any time, pretty well, certainly any time in the daytime, and get access to treatment instantly. That's the first thing. Uh, and secondly, obviously, we've got to roll out a lot more naloxone so that people that who are dying of fentanyl and who actually think they're getting heroin but they're getting fentanyl mixed with it can be treated. So we've got to roll out naloxone, the antidote, uh, much, much more effectively. And, you know, I had an email last week from someone saying, I'm desperate, I'm desperate, desperate to get naloxone, but my doctor won't prescribe it and I, my pharmacy won't give it to me. Uh, and, I mean, that's it's actually completely moronic. We, you know, we should have naloxone on the side of the streets like we have defibrillators. So, so that's the next thing to do. And then the, the other thing we've got to do is try to sw- try to, in Britain, there is some diversion of fentanyl from medical use into recreational use. So we need to try to minimise that. But overall, we must learn the lesson that banning something almost always leads to the development of something that is more toxic, more potent, lower mass, so it's more profitable for the black market. I think I might know what you might think of this question, which is it's silly to frame things as consumer choices, but I'm going to ask the stupid question anyway. Considering what we know about the violence in supply chains when you're talking about drugs like cocaine, can you consider it ethically neutral to purchase illegal drugs when you trace it back and there's a chain of violence, exploitation, dispossession and misery? Yeah, but it's also, for many people, the only viable source of income. So the farmers in Peru and Brazil and Colombia, I mean, they sell cocoa because they can't, you know, the, the price of their coffee has dropped to the point where it's unsustainable. I mean, opium was growing in, you know, in Afghanistan because it was the much, certainly way more profitable crop than anything else they could grow. So it's it's not as simple as that. Sure, you know, there's a suffering, but... Um, but it's not necessarily the case that actually uh, eliminating those markets would actually be beneficial to the people out there. But it could be. I mean, actually, here was an interesting policy that was... So I think 2004, Tony Blair was offered a solution to the Afghan opium problem. And uh, it was suggested to him that we, or the international community, buy the crop. It's about £4 billion pounds a year. Buy the, buy the Afghan, Af- Afghan opium crop. And, and everyone was happy. We buy it, we destroy it. It doesn't get you know, into the West... And the growers have cash. And he agreed. And then um, just before he signed the check or signed the contract or whatever, the, uh, he, he said, but then it's gone for good. And he said, no, no, they'll plant them next year. <laughs> and he decided then it wasn't worth it. And that's an interesting economic question. I mean, I suspect it was worth it. But we spent a trillion, trillion dollars now on the war on drugs, so a few billion each year. It'd take a long time to build up to a trillion. But anyway, he decided not to. But that would be an economically sensible thing to do, to, to give people money not to grow opium. Do you think that people in this country, when talking about drugs, are scared to admit the obvious, which is that, one, there is such a thing as safe recreational use because people do it all the time. And two, that drugs are kind of fun. Do you feel that there's a puritanism which goes, you know, far beyond the Vietnam War and it's a fear of admitting? No, well, there's a puritanism, absolutely, but it's, it's complicated puritanism. So, yeah, the temperance movement started in the 1880s. It tried to get rid of alcohol. It tried to get rid of... In the 1880s, you go into a pharmacy, you could buy tincture of cannabis, tincture of cocaine, tincture of um, heroin, tincture of morphine. And you go down the off-license and, or the pub and you could buy alcohol. And the temperance movement tried to destroy everything. Uh, and it succeeded in getting rid of all the drugs. Yeah, and it succeeded in the 1920s, as I say, in um, America and Sweden and Norway to get rid of alcohol. A lot of people don't know this, but in, I think it's in 2023, there was an election, a general election. And in Dundee, Winston Churchill stood against a temperance candidate in Dundee. And the temperance candidate beat him by 14,000 votes. So there was an enormous public antipathy to all drugs, and uh, which led to, in, in America, as I say, the, the complete um, prohibition. So there's always been a strong puritanical temperance movement. And, uh, and eventually, of course, that was turned over with, um, with alcohol. But it, it, uh, and then, as I explained earlier, Anslinger turned it on to other drugs. So yes, so you've got the puritanical temperance movement, which of course had, you know, um, 
it had two elements. It had a moral element, which is drugs are bad, and the only way you get to heaven if you don't take any. But it also was clever because it, it actually hid that behind the veneer of kids are dying, mothers are giving laudanum to their kids, opium to their kids, to shut them up, and they're dying. And uh, and that was the kind of the public hysteria. These, I mean, there probably were some deaths, accidental deaths, but that was enough to um, to get these drugs banned. But behind it also, I think the, also the alcohol industry, particularly after Prohibition, the alcohol industry decided it wasn't ever going to go down that route again. So I think it systematically tried to put out disinformation about the harms of alcohol and magnify the harms of other drugs. And we see that now in American states where... And they're, and they're rolling out, aren't they? I think what we've got now, 13 American states with legal legal cannabis. We see that that when the elections are coming up to vote for legality of cannabis, we see the alcohol industries are always supporting the anti-legalization group because it's a threat to their um, to their market. In fact, I sometimes say, and I'll say it now, that I think the the the, the alcohol industry has been you know remarkably successful in a hundred years. It's destroyed all opposition in this country. The only intoxicant now, which is legal, is actually alcohol. So it's it's Puritan morality, it's lobbying, alcohol lobbying, and it's um, and political expediency as well. So last week, Keir Starmer ruled out the legalization of cannabis, saying no, I that think he didn't. He rule out decriminalization. The decriminalization, sorry. Yeah. Uh, he ruled out the decriminalization of cannabis because he sees drugs as sitting behind an array of social ills, including knife crime, criminal mm. gangs. Mm. I don't think he's an Avara Media subscriber, but on the off chance that he's watching, what would you want to say back to him? I'd say, Keir, it's time you realize you're no longer head of public prosecutions and you have to escape from the carapace of being someone who puts people in prison. It's the old adage, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. If you're a policeman, you punish people. Or you, uh, if you're a public prosecutor, you punish people. The drug policy, we've tried for 100 years, trying to police it, trying to punish people out of it. It doesn't work. They're proven. It's not as if we're asking you to go into a field where there's not massive evidence. They're proven policies. And if you ever want me to advise you, I'm on the end of the phone. I wanted to ask you about your work on synthetic alcohol because yes. you've talked about the harms of mm, mm. Um, alcohol abuse, the fact that it's so widespread, everyone in their family knows somebody um, who who has problematic relationships with alcohol. Mm. And then even if you don't know someone with an addictive relationship to alcohol, all of us have had, you know, a night where you take it too far and you feel oh, just absolutely the one, huh? dreadful. <laughs> Just the one, I think. It was many, many years ago. Um, I also, I can name the culprit. It was Jose Cuervo Tequila. And I decided, I was mm. maybe 14, mm -hmm. and I uh, mm -hmm. decided to mm -hmm. nick off with a bottle and try and impress a boy by drinking most of it, mm -hmm. which um, it didn't impress him. And my mum has a come pick me up. Um, it was wow. dreadful, Scary. really dreadful. Um, and so you, you, you've you been doing some research into synthetic mm. alcohol, basically the idea that mm. you could have a built-in cutoff for inebriation. Am I right in saying that that was how Very good, worked? very good. That's right. We, ha we can produce what's a pla kind, of, kind of plateau effect. So we can, what we've done is we've developed molecules or we're developing molecules. We have tested some that produce some of the good effects of alcohol, but they produce a plateau the reason alcohol is so very dangerous is it, when it, it has multiple, it reacts with multiple transmitters in the brain. And we're targeting just the first one that makes you relaxed and sociable. But if you keep drinking alcohol, it goes up and up and eventually it kills you because it blocks breathing. And you're quite lucky, actually. I mean, a bottle of, of uh, tequila, hmm, you know, that could be very dangerous. You could have vomited and inhaled. So by just targeting the receptors, it causes the, the, the first. Um, step in the alcohol effect uh, we can by being very selective we can avoid all the others so that's the plateau effect yeah. so how would you if you're designing synthetic alcohol deal with the overlap and interaction between alcohol and other drugs sometimes that can be very dangerous of yes, course indeed. combining alcohol which is a depressant with something like valium or ketamine is very very dangerous or even methadone um, in fact almost all methadone say, deaths are associated with alcohol but carry on yeah. you take something like mdma and alcohol that's two drugs which are commonly combined in use. So when you're designing something like a synthetic alcohol, do you take into account all of the ways in which people will be using it? Well, the point is if you get something which uh, you can prove is less harmful than alcohol, and we're, we're targeting 100 times less harmful than alcohol in terms of safety testing, 
then it's unlikely to have a negative effect on anything. And we will test for that, of course, eventually as well. <laughs> and so in terms of the stage of the development, you know, wh- where are you? I know that there are some um, barriers. One is that you've got the alcohol industry. The other is that you've got people thinking, I don't want to take something that's synthetic. I want all natural. I love my all natural botanical gin. Um, and is so, there one? There's, where, no, there's no such thing as an all natural botanical gin. Or not all natural. There are definitely but gin analogs. The there, there are water, water is its smell of gin, a smell of juniper, but they're not like gin. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but to answer your question, yeah, we have just made a botanical spirit, a functional botanical spirit. It's called Sentia Spirits, and the first production completely sold out. There's a lot of demand out there for a, a, an active spirit that gives you some of the effects of alcohol, the relaxation, sociability, conviviality. And this is all made from natural products. It's all made from food standard herbs put together in a special combination so we get the effect we want. What's it taste like? It tastes beautiful because we have a, an amazing um, woman called Vanessa who has uh, spent her whole well, not her whole life, but she spent the last 10 years of her life making beautifully flavoured teas, and now she's moved to making this beautiful flavoured... So it tastes a mixture of um, of interesting floral herbal tastes, and uh, most people find the taste rather appealing. But it doesn't taste like gin. It doesn't taste like alcohol. No, it tastes... It's a, it's a complex herbal drink. I suppose the nearest would be to, to like, a complex vermouth. Oh, really? I'm trying to... I'm always curious about... Um, scientific advances in food and drink, so lab-grown meat. And I just think, what does it taste like? I can't picture it. I can't imagine the mouthfeel or the smell. Or well, it's kind of it's actually having once recently had a, uh, a synthetic hamburger. It is kind of dis- disconcertingly like meat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my, the last question that I wanted to ask you is in a completely different area because I know that you've also done a lot of work um, with Alzheimer's and dementia. Mm-hmm. Um, we have an aging population. We have a mm-hmm. massive gap in terms of the amount of mm-hmm. people needing care and the amount mm-hmm. of care provision. Mm-hmm. In terms of advances in treatment and early mm-hmm. identification, where are we? If you're a young person and you're worried about what's going to happen with your parents, how, how pessimistic should we be? Oh, that's a really good question. So there's many things I can say about that. So the first thing is uh, we know that we can intervene with a number of the known factors which predispose to dementias. And so, for instance, we can reduce our alcohol consumption. Alcohol is the leading cause, the leading known preventable cause of dementia. So you could cut your drinking down. We can also control your blood pressure and your cholesterol. We know that uh, a lot of dementias are due to vascular problems. And if you get your blood pressure down and, and get your cholesterol down, you don't, you, know, you can unfurl or stop your arteries clotting up so you get more blood flow to the brain. So those are two useful things we can do. You can also not get, not become diabetic because diabetes is a, a, has a major negative influence on the brain through a combination of factors, not just the high sugar, but also the inflammation that goes in the blood. So there's three things you can do there. But uh, they, and, and in fact, it seems that those already, uh, particularly the um, big input people are having in terms of controlling their blood pressure with statins and their cholesterol with statins, is actually having a having a, 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 an effect. So the dementia doesn't seem to be going up. It's not the the big increase. The increase seems to be slowing anyway. So we make. I think we are making some progress there. But then again, we also need to look and try to work out more what's going on, and that's where my research has come in. I mean, we've been developing. Um, uh, what we call imaging probes to to scan the brains of people with dementia uh, and and other neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's and Huntington's to see what's going on and it turns out that um, when we think of the brain we think of neurons we think of all these neurons firing away allowing us to think and speak and hear and see etc. But for every neuron there's about five or six other cells in the brain which are called glial cells and and these are very important for maintaining brain health. And uh, it turns out that those change in dementias as well. And we've got one of our research has shown, you know, we've got a, a probe now. We can measure those. We can measure measure the changes in them during these dementias. So that's a, that's a very exciting new development because we can potentially uh, explore how we could make the glial cells more functional, make them better at looking after the nerves. So that's a big area. And then, of course, I have this particular interest in the um, in the psych- psychedelics because. One of the most remarkable things about 
uh, the people who first used psychedelics was they lived for a very long time. So Albert Hoffman, who discovered LSD, he used it regularly, and he lived to 102. The first British psychiatrist to use it was a guy called Joel Elk. He's professor in Birmingham. He lived to 103. Um, so I think we can say that these certainly LSD doesn't fry your brain like the Americans, DEA say it does. And it may be that maybe that psychedelics could have an effect to prolong brain function. It might be that they make neurons work better. It might be they're anti-inflammatory. And that's an area that is being actively researched at present. And you might not even have to have a psychedelic dose. It might be a lower dose would work. I mean, it's possible to, to kind of loop back on what you identified as the illegality paradox. It's also possible to conceive of a world where drugs for personal and recreational use are still prohibited, but for medicine, they're yep. allowed. The yep. UK is the world's biggest exporter of medical grade mm -hmm. cannabis. So isn't there also a danger of emphasizing a health case at the expense of making one also based on personal liberty and fun and pleasure? Because you will end up with this... Cheetos. Yeah, look, I can't fight every battle. I'm a doctor. I can fight the medical battles way better than I can. I've tried fighting the social battles. I've tried fighting the political battles. Actually, I actually haven't got very far. That's your job, all right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not doing a great job of it either. But um, Professor David Nutt, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a really illuminating conversation. Thank you. It's been great. Cheers.